So the two priests had to diddle me again. They took me to a place in Pennsylvania where there was going to be a retreat at the mother house at that time of the fraternity of St. Peter. I didn't want to go, but a temptation was there. Father Ken Baker, SJ, and he was giving me the retreat. Oh, I couldn't resist, but I don't want to get mixed up in that Latin mass business. Don't worry, they said, we'll take you down to the local parish church and you can come celebrate. But diddled again, uh, one of the conferences was at a Mr. Cantata. And again, I was just absolutely struck dumb by the sheer beauty. And I said in my prayer, Lord, you win. I'm going back to take up the parish. And I will go to the Baru and try to learn how to say the old right. Well, I always felt that we were deracinated in the 70s, and we most definitely were. We were denied Latin and Greek, and when we complained that, uh, that uh, we should have Latin because the Ratio Studiorum said we should, we were told that it would be a good idea if we learned English first. Very incorrect, really, because if you learn Latin well, you learn your English roots and you learn the discipline of grammar, which of course no one learns today. But I didn't know that then. And so it's been a tough business as my Latin is so poor. And I think that's true for a lot of priests, that they haven't got the basic foundations of Latin. And so they struggle with trying to say the, the new rite, the old rite. Well, and he said he couldn't. So I was despondent. I thought, well, he's the only way I've got for the future. He's got the indult. We thought then it was abrogated, forbidden. You had to have a canonical indult, a permission to say it. They had been stopped by Cardinal Hume and Archbishop Warlock when they were being handed out in 1988 and 89. So many requests, of course, they had to be stopped. And so I missed the vote because I hadn't been any interested at all. So far. Uh, said he couldn't come, he was going to go in with the Jesuits. And so a few weeks later, only, I heard that he wanted a bed and an altar. So I said, Father, whatever happened? Oh, he said, I love the Jesuits, but I can't live with them. Thanks be to God, he came to live with me in St. And they were the two of the most exhausting years I've ever had. Schizophren schizophrenics from Nigeria, all sorts of people, family day, babies all over the floor, uh, it just never stopped. I have never met such a priest that had such a radiant sort of love of all people. He could attract all sorts of different people to him, and he was loved. And he has spiritual children dotted all over the place. Quite remarkable. But the rest is history, because in 1995 he came and we started the old rite, uh, and in 1997 he ran off because uh, he said the church in Wales needed priests, and I thought, well, what am I going to do now? I haven't got the indult, and uh, that year, and so we never stopped the mass uh, from day to day, and so it was a wonderful experience, and uh, I always said I would never leave the parish unless I could be sure of handing it on to someone who wouldn't destroy it, and I think it's a terrible thing. Uh, to think that all your work would just be uh, stopped in such a short time it, and continue this great work. It was a great work because being so reluctant, I still couldn't believe my eyes to see conversions, big families, transmissions of faith, vocations. We have an altar server who's now in Brazil, we have a young woman who's a Dominican nun in Fonjo, of course, in Strood. And all of this is a great uh, result of those wonderful years, thank God. But now we face the axe again. And how on earth are we supposed to approach it? We can get angry. We can talk about the Jesuit notion uh, of trying to think of the moral lyceity of tyrannicide and things like that. But I don't think that's really what we should be doing, especially in Lent.
We should in, in, instead try to think of something more supernatural. And I remember years ago going to see the film Gandhi and we were just so touched by that film that we ended up going to Tyburn and praying quite a long while afterwards. And I had been told that Gandhi had been very impressed by the Sermon on the Mount and he wrote a book called The Gospel of Jesus Christ. So I went to find it. I couldn't believe it. But yes, this was written by him. And he fell in love with the Gospel of our Blessed Lord. He fell in love with our Blessed Lord, if you like. He said that a Christian should be like a rose. who should just give off an aroma. But his experience of Christians was not so lovely. But he was inspired by the whole idea of non-violent resistance. And to some degree it worked, didn't it? He achieved independence at a great cost to himself, but he was a great apostle of non-violent resistance. And I think that's a huge, uh, a, a remarkable incident really in our own history. To think that a pagan can follow Christ's sermon on the mount and actually win. We're winning, of course, but we don't want to become bitter uh, in uh, a victory. The Lord promises us that we should rejoice when we're abused and uh, calumniated. We're in the place of our Lord himself. And he says that uh, when men abuse you and persecute you, speak all kinds of ill against you, rejoice and be glad. So we have to look at it in a supernatural way. And of course, penance, something that we may be allergic to, if you're anything like me, being a baby boomer or much younger, we've been spoilt. But we're invited to learn to do penance. Even Fulton Sheen once said that there was one sermon that he never preached. It was on fasting and being a good American. He'd never had that experience and the text to his sermon was in a drawer, but he never preached it because he said he couldn't practice it, which is quite a humble admission. But we have to try to begin to learn how to do it. And Mother Church bids us, and especially in the old liturgy, you notice that fasting is right there all the time. The, the fast today in the new rite is balanced out with uh, giving and, and, uh, and praying which is fine, but mostly it's about the fast. I'm always impressed by my Coptic brothers and sisters. I think they try to compete with their fellow Muslims because they're fasting for a good deal of the year and they give up meat and all dairy products and live on beans and fish and they always lose weight during the Great Lent. And fasting is the prayer of the body. And if Gandhi could win with his celibacy, with his non-violent resistance, with his fasting, we can win as well. And we're told that, that certain types of devil could only be ejected by prayer and fasting. That's in the Gospel. And it's a balance of the prayer of the mind, the prayer of the heart, the prayer of the body. Uh, but it's difficult. And so every day, we have to begin and begin again. Cardinal Sarah felt that the attack against the tradition was diabolical. I think we can appreciate that. And I think that it's a spiritual war. And so we shouldn't allow ourselves to become angry or bitter or resentful but we should realize what we're against and take up the sword and fight in a spiritual way. And how do we do that? Fasting, prayer, generosity, and with this intention. Motivation is the secret of history, they say. And if we can see a result to our prayer and fasting and it's there for the seeing, then it helps us to run the race. And my dear friends, we need that fasting and prayer now 
We need that motivation to help traditional Catholicism to survive, because it's not just something for our own church. We see that beyond the confines of the church, even the FBI is suspicious of traditional Catholicism. The globalists despise it. It definitely has to be a diabolical rage against the fullness of the faith, against the faith that can win, against the faith that can be powerful, against the faith that can resist even the onslaughts of the enemy. And so, we're going to ask St. Joseph. What does St. Teresa say about St. Joseph? She said that she could write a book about how in all of her adventures up and down Spain, he'd never let her down. But she said, I'm a busy woman. I haven't got time to write a book. So you, you try on yourself and see. So let's do that. Let's begin this month of St. Joseph uh, by making a novena to him, by asking him to help us with our fast, fast, by invoking him, by trying to run the race and asking him to obtain the graces we need. And especially in this uh, survival of our traditional faith, because the traditional faith is the rich soil that can germinate and make things flower and fruit, and that will make all the dif difference for the future of the Church and for the future of the world.